Effectively managing the master vendor file is a critical part of the accounting or accounts payable process that requires controls, best practices, as well as fraud prevention protocols. It should not be an afterthought, as unfortunately it sometimes is. Today we're going to take a closer look at some key master vendor file management issues that are sadly not always addressed. Make sure you stick around until the end when we discuss practices that have only come into play in the last few years. Let's make sure we're all on the same page and start by defining what is the master vendor file. The master vendor file is the repository of information needed to pay vendors or suppliers. Each supplier should be in the master vendor file once and only once. But that is easier said than done unless very rigid strict best practices are used around the master vendor file function. To those not familiar with this issue, this might seem like not a big deal, but it is. Some of them will say, what's the big deal? What can go wrong if the supplier is listed a second time in the master vendor file? First, let me state the obvious. When a supplier gets into the master vendor file a second time, it is a sign that internal controls are not nearly as strong as they should be. That second entry shows a breakdown of controls someplace. This is a problem because it makes it easier for the processor to mistakenly pay a vendor a second time. And as many of those who are involved in the accounts payable and payment function know, duplicate payments are rarely returned voluntarily. That's bad enough, but a duplicate vendor in the master vendor file also facilitates fraud, something not many think about. Less than honorable employees trying to play games by submitting phony invoices, for example, know they need to have a vendor file for it to go again. If there's an inactive or duplicate entry that can provide them the cover they need, then they're good to go. There's an even more heartbreaking issue. If you have a duplicate entry in the master vendor file and unintentionally double pay the less than honorable supplier, that supplier may realize you have control issues and amp up their efforts to get you to double pay again. They may do this by submitting copies of invoices to several individuals in your organization, creating tons of extra work for your accounts payable staff, even if they don't eventually double pay. Or they may resubmit invoices that have already been paid. Whatever they do, it's not good. It's extra work for you. They either trick you into paying twice or create a whole lot of extra work for your staff. And as I said, neither of those are a good thing. Not everyone refers to the master vendor file as the master vendor file. What are some of the other names used for the master vendor file? Some refer to it as the vendor master file and others simply call it the vendor file. Now in some companies, different departments will have their own vendor files to address whatever their own particular needs are. In fact, sometimes even purchasing will have its own vendor file separate from the one used in accounts payable but that is not too common. This brings up the next issues related to master vendor file. Who has responsibility for the master vendor file? Now, let me be clear. There is no absolute right or wrong answer to this question. The first consideration and most important relates to appropriate separation of duties. The responsibility should lie with the group that has enough personnel to handle the function appropriately while still maintaining appropriate separation of duties. As technology takes over more and more of the transactional work in the accounts payable function, the accounts payable departments, like many others, are getting smaller and smaller. So while accounts payable might seem like the logical place to house responsibility for the accounts payable function, smaller staff sometimes make that impossible for the appropriate separation of duties issues. Once you've addressed the appropriate separation of duty issue, the next issue is who has the bandwidth to handle the day-to-day -day tasks related to the master vendor file on a very current basis. You can't leave new vendors set up until the end of the month and set them all up at one time then. While this may seem like an ideal situation for the person who has to set the vendors up, it's not ideal for the operation of the business. Since an invoice can't be processed until the vendor is set up, you need to put this responsibility with someone who will set up new vendors and make changes to existing vendors every day or every second day. Now, the temptation is to let invoice processes set up new vendors and make changes to existing vendors, but this creates a control issue as it negates appropriate separation of duties. So as tempting as it may be, don't do it. Another tempting issue is to leave all suppliers in the master vendor file forever in case you want to do business with them again in the future and then you won't have to set them up again. The problems with this are several. After a number of years, the, the master vendor file will be large, unwieldy, and rife with opportunities for error and worse. 
So let's address the lifespan of a supplier in the master vendor file. Does a, lot, does a supplier stay in the master vendor file forever? Technically, the answer to that is yes, but they should be deactivated if you haven't done business with them in the last 12 or 14 months. Leaving an inactive vendor in the master vendor file, just like a duplicate vendor, can facilitate fraud if you have an employee looking to play games, and by this I mean looking to defraud the company, usually, although not always, through embezzlement. This is called cleansing the master vendor file. The vendor history should not be deleted. This way, if the supplier comes back two years from now and claims you didn't pay a particular invoice, and yes, that happens, you have the records to research and prove that you did. Basically, a supplier should stay active in the master vendor file as long as you continue to do business with that supplier on a regular basis. Once you stop doing business, the supplier can be deactivated but you will always have the history of that relationship, really important. If you start doing business with that supplier again, you should re-verify their information as if they were a brand new supplier. This brings up the issue of setting up vendors in the master vendor file. What's involved with setting up a new vendor? It first involves entering data provided by the new supplier. Often this information is taken directly from the invoice. And while there is nothing inherently wrong with this approach, assuming you are verifying that it's a little legitimate vendor, more on that a little bit later, there are better ways. Ideally, you will have a vendor form or application and will also send the new supplier a W-9 from which you'll collect taxpayer identification number and an ACH payment form to collect bank account data so you can pay them electronically using the ACH. This can either be sent by the person responsible for the master vendor file or by the purchasing professional, ideally before they send the first purchase order. However, in reality, most accounts payable departments don't find out about a new vendor until that first invoice arrives. And then they have to hustle to get the vendor information collected and given to the person responsible for the master vendor file. You should also do some basic verifications before making that first payment. Now, before we get to those verifications, if you're getting value from this talk, I would love it if you'd hit the like or the thumbs up button. It sends a message that you are getting value from this talk and I should make more like it. Personal thanks from me to everyone who has hit that button. What basic verifications should you do on the master vendor file data when setting up a new vendor? Once the data is collected, the information on the W-9 needs to be run through IRS TIN matching program to verify if the name and the TIN match what the IRS has on its records. This will greatly reduce the number of B notices you receive, which, if you've ever had to deal with them, you know is a huge pain in the you-know-what and wastes a lot of valuable time. If there is a mismatch, get the information corrected from the supplier and run it through IRS TIN matching again. Do this until it's correct. You want to do this before you make the first payment. The reason for this is simple. As long as the supplier is waiting for their money, they are more likely to comply with your requests. Once you make the payment, the power dynamic shifts, especially if there are new, new orders forthcoming. At that point, doing what you ask becomes a very low priority for your supplier. It is strongly recommended that this TIN matching be done when the supplier is first set up. Some organizations wait until the end of the year and then run either all their suppliers or all new supplies through IRS TIN matching. Then they try and correct any mismatches. It's much harder to do at that point for the reasons discussed above. Plus, some of your original contacts may have left their positions and tracking down their replacements and getting them to correct the old information will be a real trick of diplomacy. Companies should also verify that their suppliers are not on the most current SDN, specially designated nationals list with the US Treasury, something that was not considered a best practice until recently. The U.S. Treasury's list of specially designated nationals is a list of folks the U.S. government does not want its citizens or what it calls U.S. persons, includes U.S. companies and other organizations doing business in the U.S., doing business with. It includes terrorists from the OFAC list as well as drug dealers and others, and you may not pay them. You may recall when Russia invaded the Ukraine, several Russian entities were added to this list. A word of caution. Expect to get some false positive. So no heart failure when running your new supplier through the list and you get a hit. Investigate. In all likelihood, you will find an entity with a similar name or one located in a different country. The last verification that you should do up front involves 
running the addresses of your new supplier against the addresses in your HR file. The purpose of this is to identify any employee trying to set up a phantom vendor. You won't find many, but when you find one, you will have saved your organization lots of money and headache. It really is very simple to do. But as with other matches, investigate before accusing. There could be a good reason for the match. If you reach the conclusion that there is some game playing going on, get your boss and someone from HR involved before you make accusations. From this, you should take away that your investigation should not involve asking the suspected culprit about the match. This brings up the issue of verification for changes of data in existing supplier's information. What verifications, if any, should be done when there is a change of information request made for an existing supplier? It's real simple. Any change should be verified. As you can probably guess, this has only become a necessity in the last few years. This has gotten critically important with the explosion of those emails impersonating the CFO or other high-level executive requesting a rush wire transfer, as well as emails from existing suppliers requesting a change of bank account for an ACH. Most are legitimate, but the few that are phony have been a real problem. Now, it's imperative because of this that all these requests be verified and regrettably this involves picking up the phone and calling. The process of tracking down the right person and doing the verification can be time consuming, but not doing it can be costly if you send the money to a crook. So smart companies now verify every single one of these requests, even though, as I said, most are completely legitimate. Sadly, there are many worse practices in use when it comes to the master vendor file. They lead to duplicate payments, fraudulent payments, and errors, which take time to fix. We think it is so important that you recognize what these weak practices are so that you can avoid them, that we made a short video about them, which you can watch right now using the link that has appeared on your YouTube screen and is in the description. Good luck.